Hey everyone, my name is Kyler Hall and I'm here to talk to you about adopting design system foundations at scale. So I work at Atlassian as a principal engineer and I've been focused on driving adoption for the past year. So today I'm gonna just tell you about the Atlassian design system, um, how we've laddered up to company objectives and the strategies we use to drive adoption and how we're scaling all this up. So first off, no special name here. We're just called the Atlassian Design System. We've been around for about 12 years under several revisions. We started out as more design guidelines and now we're a full React library and Figma library, the usual stuff. Uh, we impact about 2,500 engineers internally and designers, uh, spanning more than 20 products across Atlassian. We're used by tens of thousands of marketplace vendors and seen by millions of people. I'm sure a lot of you in this crowd probably see what we uh, put out. So I think we have a pretty normal amount of components, but we ship these across 80 different packages, and these offerings are used more than 500,000 times across all of our products. So just to look at JIRA as one example, our button component alone is used 6,500 times directly, and our tokens are used about 35,000 times. So I'll use the word adoption a lot today, just like I do in everyday life. Uh, I'll define this because it might mean something different for you. Um, for us, we really want to know the percentage of the Atlassian design system in a Figma library or code base versus everything else. So we take a ratio of adopted things versus unadopted things. So adopted things are the number of times that something from our system is used. These are things like buttons and tokens. And then we try and count up all the unadopted things. These are things that are, well, everything else, not in our system. These could be native components, they could be custom components, third-party components, hard-coded colors and border radiuses, that kind of stuff. So to kind of look at JIRA with that, our button has about 67% adoption, whereas our color tokens have about 98% adoption. And we use these metrics to understand, I guess, our impact across Atlassian but also to understand when we have enough critical mass to make a change with that adoption. So kind of looking at adoption uh, in the past year across JIRA in this case, about 35% of JIRA used our design system directly, uh, but it's been about more than 50% of new code. So at least it was heading in the right direction. But we've corrected this quite a bit in the past year by looking at foundational gaps and strategies. And now we're seeing about 50% of existing code, but 80% of all new development is using our system. And we hope to really improve this in the coming year. Um, we think that by focusing on foundations, we can actually get closer to about 90% of new development using at least some part of our system. Uh, and we might be able to backfill some adoption as well. So since I joined Atlassian a couple of years ago, I think the hardest part I saw was just design system is hard to get leadership alignment on. The value of a design system isn't always clear, especially across different crafts. So my key focus since joining has really been to promote and align with those company objectives and initiatives that we have to make room for our system to improve without being constantly sidetracked by every single feature request that comes along. So one of those objectives, I guess, that we've shown off at our own Team 24 conference is a little bit of a visual refresh. So I think the Atlassian design system is always kind of working towards a visual refresh, but now the company is, is more widely involved. So while this is our overarching goal, it's not really ready on the engineering side, so we can't constantly work on it. We need an alternative path to kind of work towards while design figures out, okay, what is actually gonna, gonna change? So another clear opportunity for me was actually developer productivity. For the engineering side of our organization, this was a lot easier to market. So we've been selling developer productivity so that we can align with and work towards this visual refresh on the side. And that's been our way in actually the past year to drive all this adoption. So if you, if you ever spin up a program and promise people productivity, you're gonna ask a question like, what does a design system have to do with developer productivity? And I think it's actually a pretty easy answer for engineering leaders. They just might not know it. 
it has about the same offering as any other platform portfolio component that they might have. Because developers use buttons every single day. Those buttons are tied to business metrics, actually. They're call to actions. They impact user experience and that kind of stuff. So if you let developers reuse a button, and then you're going to really improve the productivity of that. But realistically, selling historical productivity wasn't going to happen. The ask was, OK, how do you make developers more productive? So we took to surveys, interviews, and benchmarks, and we found four key areas of productivity. Then I'll dive into the highlights. So the first one is something we call primitive components. I guess the background here is that we saw developers constantly building the same micro layouts in every single new feature. And while we could have gone ahead and built a dozen card and accordion components, we didn't really see the value in creating basically a 20th card component across Atlassian that would only get fractional adoption. So instead, we decided to help developers compose their own components with these building blocks to make that a much faster process. So we broke that problem with all the layouts into foundations with primitives and tokens so they can build something greater. And this really enabled a lot of consistency, both across products, but it translated perfectly well in Figma with auto layout and stuff like that. The other key opportunity was tokens. And I won't really try and sell you on tokens. I hope you all know what tokens are. But for us, this just really ramped up our consistency across Figma and code. Everything is in sync where we have a token, at least. Um, but we could actually measure the productivity here of that decision fatigue on which color token should I use or which color value should I use. So off the back of dark mode, we're expanding into more foundations like spacing and topography because these will help really enable iterations towards our visual refresh in the future. And these productivity gains has actually really stood out at Atlassian. We're saving about 130 engineering years in this year. And that's because developers are building layouts about 35% faster with up to 80% less code. And it really does improve that Figma to code alignment and even cross product alignment. But just building these building blocks out it really isn't enough. They're more productive and you know, they enable the visual refresh. But we really need people to use them. If they don't use them, it doesn't actually do anything for us. So we actually had to promise adoption this year and drive it ourselves. We couldn't just wait around for it. And immediately, I guess, saying, hey, we're going to fix adoption, we got questions like, well, what are your strategies for driving adoption? And how will this be different from the past platform adoption attempts? And honestly, I think I started last year with, without really any good answers. We knew that we could change color tokens, but that was about it. But I guess fast forward a year, I actually have some answers now. The key success for us has really been pretty basic education and outreach, because developers and designers just want to know what good looks like. They don't have enough examples. This is crucial in new development. But our real focus has actually been on automation. We've seen a huge opportunity to remove unnecessary decisions and effort from people. So that first re, you know, focus is outreach and education. We try and market everything. We really want to keep it playful and engaging and keep people excited. And our target here is actually just designers and developers. We don't really focus on leadership because we think that adoption typically needs to be ground up. You know, If your designers don't like it, it's not going to make it into your product. Uh, but these blogs actually only go so far. So we try and roll that same education and opinion into the designer and developer workflows. So that's using something like ESLint on the coding side. And we can shift documentation far left so that developers actually have all of this available at their fingertips while they build in their IDE. And I guess an example here is that a developer would see an error because this is an unadopted button with unadopted tokens and a, and a bunch of other issues. So we actually have about 100 different ESLint rules and code mods that we use to migrate things like that into our system. And we can actually automate a fair bit of this without any input from products or teams nowadays. And even when we can't automate, really just having that documentation in place lets people understand that there is something they should be building. And it gives that point for a discussion. They can reach out and have a conversation, whereas before, they had no idea. And I guess the final strategy is enforcement. So with all of these adoption metrics and signals we have, we give teams and leadership a better picture of where they're at today and where we need them to be for future initiatives. Because just showing those errors in an IDE doesn't really 
tell a team very much, especially because 100% adoption is almost never the goal. And finally, I guess off the back of ESLint rules, we actually have a system to generate JIRA issues for teams to action when we need their help. Because a lot of adoption requires decisions that we can't make for products, we can't automate. So instead, we give them tasks with clear guidance and asks so they can make them for us. And really, all of this has come together very, very well for us. We've migrated 40,000 tokens, mostly through automation. We've built and drove the adoption of 12,500 primitive components. And effectively, about 90% of all new layouts use our primitives. And we've driven key component adoption like buttons by almost 25%. And we've even standardized almost 50,000 styling patterns to make this all safer to evolve in the future. And realistically, this all resulted in us smashing our goals, actually. We landed it about four months early. But I think most importantly, we think we now know how to drive adoption. But I guess, yeah, now, now we know how to drive adoption. We find ourselves with a new problem. Um, we own a bunch more code than we used to, in some cases almost double, depending on the product. How do we ever change that code now? Um, we need to you know, ship value to customers and evolve our products. How do we do that? So I'll, I'll give you an example of the button. I know everyone's using a button today, but here we go. Um, so you may remember there's about 6,500 different buttons in Jira. Um, so changes to a button can actually be quite complex. My hypothetical here is what if the visual refresh tells us that we need to change thousands of buttons from blue to a new, more rounded purple? And that's been my focus on the engineering side. While design goes and figures out if we should have a purple button, I, I don't know. Um, you know, the engineering just drives adoption across our products so that when that decision is made, we're prepared for sweeping visual changes. And I think the common misconception, you know, internally and externally is that, okay, you have a lot of adoption. Uh, your changes can dro just drop in, right? But I think the reality is, is that most people, or a lot of people, don't use our button correctly. They use our button in places where it should not be a button. They override the styles and detach the instances. And they use a lot of other buttons. I mean, you know, 33% of all buttons in Jira are not our button, and they probably should be. So if we actually set out to make this change, we would quickly realize that there's a couple of problems. You know, maybe the link should still be blue, and we don't actually know what some stuff changed. Like, that should probably not be changed. It's not a button. Um, and I guess this is all to say that we found that not all adoption is good adoption we really had to be vigilant, and any change requires a process and some diligence behind it. So we've actually had some help in changing that process so we can drive change to customers a lot better. I'll kind of walk through our release methodology here. So 12 months, I think it was pretty basic. We do the usual design exploration, we build the feature, and we would package it up via NPM. But then, realistically, products were never in a hurry they would just adopt our new button when it suits them. You know, we've done our job, we sit back, we relax, we probably move on to another project. Um, but these button changes on average would take four months to even make its way into a product. So as a team, that's really frustrating when you can't see your changes for months on end. But eventually products would unblock and they'd start their rollout. Um, this might even take a couple iterations because they might find some bugs and then we have to go through that long re-adoption or migration process again. Uh, but typically after about three to six months, customers would start to see our, our new purple button. Um, but this is actually a lot better today. Our front-end monorepo architecture has been evolving to eliminate this gap. The change is still about the same. We, we do our design and, and uh, development, but immediately once we merge, we've dropped the concept of package versions internally. So this change is already available in products, but it's behind a feature flag or, or some other means. So it's available for internal dog fooding. We turn it on to all internal Atlassians. They'll see all these purple buttons, but customers might not unless we're confident in that change already. Uh, so in this case, I guess the purple button had some changes, uh, some problems, and needs a little bit more change. It's not ready for customers. So we would pause our feature flag, we'd get to work, and we'd use those same strategies of automation and enforcement to actually drive this change ourselves rather than waiting for products to do the work. So we're in the driver's seat. We may not do all the work, but we're at least in charge of this, and, and we know the status of it. And it can actually be a quite, quite a complex process that is hard on the team, but it's really worth it because the, the impact on the customers at the end of the day 
is night and day. And yeah, typically after a much faster process, this is gonna take weeks on average rather than months on average, um, we can actually turn our changes on and customers will, will see our changes. However, this flow isn't always done yet, so this new flow leaves us with technical debt quite a bit because we may hurry through certain parts, turn feature flags on in some places but not in others because we just need to get this out and then we can iterate on the small parts that just need a little bit of cleanup in the future. But realistically, comparing these two flows side by side, in some cases, customers get our changes within days. Like, the productivity and, I guess, customer value difference here is just completely worth it for the amount of complexity that we add. Instead of waiting for months, you know, it can land almost immediately. But really, I guess, the, driving all this change and adoption comes with a lot of new responsibilities and stresses that have, you know, impacted our team. We're now contributing directly to a lot of unknown code. And we're on the hook to actually maintain and fix that code when it breaks sometimes, which can be scary. This can be really hard to plan and prioritize because yet yeah, a change could take two days or it could take four months. We don't actually know until we try and roll it out into a product what, what that process will look like. And we're really walking a fine line here between defining what good is and trying to evolve products ourselves versus just policing everyone and removing their decisions and ownership entirely. And I guess this is all to say, not all of this is solved, but really our customers are in focus here and we feel it's worth it. So if we want to change you know, a critical bug or land an accessibility feature, that can happen much, much faster than before. So to wrap everything up, I guess, first off, I, I think a design system should always improve the productivity of building features from your products. But I think this is a lot more than just buttons and tables. I think there's a lot of small foundational parts of your system that exist or don't exist that will actually have a huge impact on that productivity as well. So for us, yeah, building these smaller foundations really gives our products a lot of consistency and flexibility, but it's improved that time to market as well. And it's really gonna help enable this future visual refresh to come because we have a much wider surface area to drive adoption on and then make use of for change when the time comes. And in the last year, yeah, we focused on really shifting all of our education directly to developer and designer workflows as much as we can. And we try and automate as much of the unnecessary decisions and effort that we possibly can. And our new release model has really enabled us to cut out the middleman that is products at times so we can ship changes directly to customers in a fraction of the time. And the outcome, again, has been very rewarding. We've massively increased adoption in so many places. And we've actually changed the way that developers build on a daily basis. And we've been able to ladder up to company objectives, saving 130 engineering years of productivity and putting us in a much better place to execute on that visual refresh. So I think if any of this really makes a lot of sense to you or you know, feels valuable, I would try and find opportunities for your design system within your company objectives or initiatives or whatever they may be. At different scales, they mean different things. But I think there's a lot of opportunity in you know, trying to look for the gaps, fill in the gaps, and make systemic changes or widespread changes um, for yourself rather than just pushing out changes and forgetting about them. All right, and that's about it for me. Thanks so much for having a listen and enjoy the rest of the conversation.